Yes. And then we could play with, uh, we can set up again to start again. We say, okay, what about if the blue can only have a little bit children more often than the red? What would happen? It would also outcompete. You can see here in the graph that this one disappeared, but it would take less time. So this is something that we can use to explore what is happening in our system. So this is more of a simplified model, but maybe we could inform it if we really knew what are the birth rates of our species of interest, how much food is out there in the um, environment. You see what I mean? Another example is about fire. I really like this one. So we have a forest landscape, and then the fire goes. You can see how this fire spreads from the left to the right. Oh, sorry, I didn't know that. Oh, okay. So we can change the, the density of the tree cover. So if we put it less, or maybe even less, let's put it like 20%. How far the fire would go? Did you see? Barely anything. Now let's put a lot of tree cover. Just a couple of trees were spared. Eh? You can see them here. So we can also build a model that helps us understand how tree density affects fire spread in our landscape. Well, and I think what's really interesting about these, these models is they allow you to find thresholds. So you'll find that if you run this over and over again, mm -hmm. like there's a point at which you're always only, bur only burning like 13% of the forest. Mm -hmm. And if you go past, I can't remember, it's like 50. Let me try. I was trying to find, yeah. I think it's 60, yeah. So um, if you have more than 60, then it spreads, I think. Every eh? time it burns the whole thing. Um, and so that's called a threshold. You wouldn't expect, like you would expect a linear relationship when in fact there isn't, it's not. Uh -huh. I think it's about 60, yeah. I think it's 59. Can try. 59, you see? So see, this is the kind of things we cannot do in real life, eh? because burning forests just to try to find the threshold is a little bit difficult. But we could try to model it if we know how far, I mean, what are the logic, the conditions that have to be met for it to spread. Yeah, it should be, I think 61, it, it, but we also need to try different times. I mean, you would run different simulations. Yeah. So now we look at one that it's, um, let me see the virus. So now we go, so in this case we have um, a set of humans that some have uh, a disease, which is the red ones, and we can play with how infectious is this disease, what are the chances of recovering, and how many weeks it lasts. So we let it go, and we can see how the sick people increase, and at some time, you know, we can follow what is happening over time, now we could maybe say, okay, <coughs> The chances of recovery are lower, what may happen? You know, we can just play with it. So it helps, but actually models like these are used to understand how diseases are spread in populations. In related to the density of the cities, for example, of other urban areas, or even just in a normal bigger landscape. Yeah? So so I'm going to show you three models that actually focus in this combination on the ecological part and on the social part. So the first one that I'll show you is about uh, agropastoral systems in Kenya. So as you may know, there's been a change in the agropastoral systems in the drylands of Africa, not just in Kenya, where pastoralists used to roam around and there were no fences, and now because of uh, new infrastructure and also the fact that people may want to fence their land to make sure they own it or to justify they're there or for other purposes maybe to 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 grow crops in this part or maybe this is a private ranch so there's been a lot of changes in that landscape so this um, Bon is actually a professor of mine and and his colleague they developed a model for the area around um, Amboseli in southern Kenya so this is the area they studied and uh, 
Well, there's a little bit of a background, it's a dry land area, there's a lot of wildlife and there's the pastoralis. So pastoralis are roaming around, following where the grass is green and then the wildlife also changes their um, distribution depending on where the pasture is. Um, that's it. So what they did, they, they had this question that was, what about if this area on the right side, the, the Chulu Hills, was turned into agriculture? What about if we fence it? And we were um, cultivating there, and uh, not just the, the pastoralists, but also the wildlife would have no access to this area, which is mostly used as a dry season uh, grazing area. What may happen? So they developed this super, super detailed model that has two parts. The first part is called savanna, and what they did, they had very detailed information on okay, when there's this amount of rainfall, how fast the grass of certain type is going to grow? Okay, where, how much does a zebra need to eat? Where do they going to go? What about the cows that are there? What are they going to go? So this part, the savanna model was developed in the beginning, was mostly on the wildlife and livestock interaction with the environment, also related to the climate. Then they realized that it would be interesting to see how changes in the environment were affecting the way people were making decisions. And that's when they build the Asian-based model that they call it the Kuma, and they they see uh, they create this um, number of households in the area where they have a number of livestock, and depending on on their livelihood, they eat some of the livestock, they sell some of the livestock, and it depends also on how much grass is out there and how much fodder is for their livestock. And they connected these two models. So this is very clear, there was the social model and the ecological model and they connected to predict or try to see what may happen if we fence this area in, in, uh, in the study area. And when they found out that it was that if we fence the Chulus and the Maasai were not going, uh, no longer available to go there for grazing in the dry season, then people would be forced to sell part of the cattle. So it would change the way the number of animals people own, but also, of course, the dynamics in the society, because for the Maasai, um, not only their savings are stuck in a life cattle in most of the cases, but also their social status, the way they marry, so it has a big effect on their society. And uh, the mi this model that is very detailed actually has been used to s uh, investigate all the possible responses of the study area with regard to climate change or drought, also, how much livestock could you really keep in this landscape without making it degraded? So how much should be out there for the peop I mean, for every household is allowed to have? Where should we cultivate or if, if it was worth the cultivation? Because when you cultivate, you get money from cultivation, but you have less ca pasture for your, for your animals. So this is a very detailed model that took actually many years to build and I, I think they survey like 3,000 households in the study area to really create the social part of the study. This is based on 3,000 household surveys so it's a lot of information that is needed but it's really detailed so it can really be used to help inform management. The second example I'm going to present is from Mexico. This is for you, Taune. That's why I choose this one. <laughs> no, I think it's a really nice paper and it's recent. That's why I wanted to t tell you about it. So this is, this is a small reserve in southern Mexico that it's a bit like this. You have these hills with uh, the pine savanna, so it's kind of a dry forest, quite open. And then in the lower areas, there's people that have cattle. And the question is like, um, oh yeah, the, the people get extra money from collect for collecting the resin in the pine trees. So this is an important non-timber forest product in the area. The problem is that it seems that the, these pines are not recruiting very well. The problem seems to be that there's this invasive grass species that is growing too tall and the small uh, pine trees cannot grow. The question is, I mean, the question was for the management. What should we do? Should we let more cows come and see if they eat more? You know, should we have a greater cattle density, so they overgraze the invasive species? Should we just burn this invasive grass? Should we just try to plant trees? What should we do? So they built a model that is also a mix of social and ecological models. So they had a model for the trees, how fast they grow, in which kind of environment, so they grow okay in the pine needle litter or in the short grass, 
but they don't do very well in the exotic grass. Then of course as trees grow, some die because it's in the shade and then so they create a whole ecological model for the pine species dynamics. They created another model for the fire. So which one burns in which area and why? Then also they they took into account that cows just uh, trample the tree seedlings but also eats grass and then the social aspect because a farmer needs to decide what to do with the plot of land he has. And usually farmers try to make whatever gives them the most money, especially in an area where they're poor and this little like $10 difference or $5 difference is a big share of their income. So the idea was to combine the different parts and see what would be better, which would be the most effective management intervention and also cost effective, not just effective but also a little bit cheaper. And it, this is just a little bit how it looks, so they had this, okay we want the forest to maybe be bigger but if it's too thick there's no space for cows to graze and these people are also cattle grazers, which type of grass are we interested <coughs> in and so on. And um, what they found out it was that it really depended on who was making the choices and this is going back a little bit to the presentation I gave on Saturday on when we think about ecosystem services for whom. Who is the one that benefits and who is the one who thinks is important. And um, anyway, just a little bit, so this team, so it was a participatory uh, modeling exercise, so they got, uh, no, gathered in a workshop and they had a group that was only farmers a group that was only like maybe high level management and a group that was mixed and they tried to decide each of them which was better or f for them maybe not better in general but for them so for example this group investigated okay we'll have a lot of interventions we'll have cattle we'll wheat so we'll have humans removing some of these invasive great great grasses and we'd also do rotation so we leave some time for the the pine trees to to grow before the cows step on them and they got, okay, uh, about 27 barrels of uh, resin, about this number of recruits of pines and this amount of calves. And you can see that the numbers don't differ that much. And if we compare with this intervention, it's not that different, the amount of barrels of resin that you can get and of calves. And actually it might be cheaper to do because if you only do cattle and rotation, you don't do the weeding, which is, requires a lot of human power, it might be cheaper. So maybe this is a good compromise because we get nearly the same benefits but it's much cheaper the intervention. So modeling can help us, as I said, discuss what are the potential managing interventions that we want to do and, and how are, may we benefit from them. So the other example that I want to show you is about uh, slash and burn agriculture. And uh, as, I, as you know I work in tropical forests and it's always a problem. People clear patch of land, they cultivate, but after a few years, sometimes very few years, the soil fertility declines so much that the crop yields are too low and they need to go and clear land elsewhere. And the process starts again. So you have this combination of old growth forest and younger forest regenerating and then the people cultivating. So you explore these thresholds. So it's also good to look at the info tab of what they recommend you exploring with the model that is out there. And of course, as you learn more about it, look at the code tab. Because you know, first the first time I opened a code, eh, to me it looked like Chinese. Mm -hmm. I could not make any sense of it. I just saw these colors and these lines that are on the right and on the left, and why this one is on the right and not on the left, and you see here there's even like two steps. And what is all this? It was Chinese to me. But you know, really, after a few months, I would even say maybe after a month already, I was trying to starting to make sense of things. Maybe I couldn't write my code, but at least now I could understand that to set up, it means to start the first page in the model. That patches, this is the cells in the background, a bit like the raster. The background is cells like that. So I think that's the end of my presentation. Uh, we probably have 30 minutes for people that have started their, already their tutorials or if they have questions or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, earlier yes. on I did ask about plants. Have you got examples? But you saw the one about fire, yeah, how it I was did, but uh, what about uh, like exti extinction rate of some species? Let's say for example, mm -hmm. um, this endangered one. If you want to, to find out how the population is going to behave. Or may behave. Yeah, uh -huh. may behave. I think I would invite you to go, I mean, 
I haven't looked at one myself, but this is the. I would first I would check the NetLogo library mm -hmm. and the biology mm -hmm. and see if there's one yeah. about extinction All right. or endangered species or something like that. Mm -hmm. If you don't see anything, you can also try the code database from ComSES okay. and see if people. Maybe you can even look at one on animals just to see which factors they consider. You know, okay, if you study birds, they move a lot, eh? mm -hmm. but if you study slugs. They might not move that much, so it might be more relevant to the kind of scale that you want to look into it. Mm -hmm. yes. No problem. Yes? I think the, uh, the example of the give, given in the PowerPoint. Yes. Uh, can it be used to, to measure the time <coughs> which some species can take to be spread in your community. You could also use that. You would not. You would need to know what is the landscape. So maybe, for example, you could have a landsat or some kind of land cover classification, and you would need to know for your species of interest how fast or how far the seeds disseminate. You can build it. Yeah, you can do. I think it can be done. Yeah. Any other question? Good. I can't believe it's so clear. No more questions. Great. <laughs> oh, sorry, Anthony. So, uh, just uh, trying to go around the net logo uh, software, and uh, I don't know. Will we go through a process of uh, uh, using it ourselves? Like, let's say, uh -huh. in a new uh, net logo uh, project, you want to put in the factors, just like you had it. Right uh huh. That's why I said that we don't have time for everything. Okay. But I think if you did the tutorial tree, it teaches you how to create the buttons. Yeah. So it's a bit step by step. Okay. Yes. If you are interested, I have some other material that you can try. No, there's no time to do this in the Blackboard, eh? because this is learning a new language in 20 minutes, impossible. That's why I say, but if you are interested, we can look into it. Yeah. But I think that before coding, remember, eh? before you code anything, you need to sit down and think what are you going to include in the model and what you're not going to include and why. And what you want to include now, you think, where you are going to get the data for that or how you can <coughs> approximate it. Eh? So the last thing, really, the very last step of the modeling process is the coding. You have at least five or six steps before thinking about the process. You write a diagram like the one I show you for my site. OK, what are the things I'm going to include in the model? How do they interact? How is there any feedback or not? How do they want? So I think I invite you that if you have an idea, I think it's great. Spend the time tonight to create a diagram. Then you come to me tomorrow and we can see if we can find a similar model that you can find, or if I can tell you, oh no, it's too complex, you need to simplify to start with. Mm -hmm.